this is where I feel alive and I feel happy and I feel at home. So then he got annoyed. He sent the divorce papers. He's, I signed them. I think well, he wanted to kutisa me. He wanted to scare me. I'm like, you are joking. Where about it? I notarized. <laughs> I got them notarized, sent them back. He was like, he was like, damn, that was fast. I'm like, not fast enough. <laughs> Well, I grew up with seven brothers, and uh, I just loved music. I listened to Whitney Houston on top of the pops, and um, Tony Braxton on top of the pops. And I remember my, my my brothers would be fighting with me, and of course, boys they'd be beating me up. But I remember in the process of being beaten up, I'd be like, "Oh my god, oh my god, I can hear Whitney Houston on top of the pops." So I say, if I can just watch this for like. Two, three minutes let me watch her sing then you can kill me after they'll be like okay we're giving you two minutes so i'd watch and i'd be like wow and i'd mimic her and then after that they'll finish me off so that is how i grew up listening to music loving music and my mom was like wow this girl loves music so when i went to the Karatumba academy i joined the school choir i remember um it was my, my most memorable experience because I loved the school choir. I was always the first in line for the school choir. I was the first in the dining hall when we come to school practice. But then we had a, a school teacher called Miss Anyansio. Miss Anyansio noticed that every time we are singing, there is a voice that's too loud. The voice is too loud. It's either he'd be like, who's that that's singing? Angela. My voice is so powerful. One minute, I'm naturally an auto. So one minute I'm singing alto, and then naturally, next minute I'm singing soprano, next minute I'm singing, um, uh, sometimes I hit some tenor notes. Huh? So in choir, of course, that's not allowed. So I always had an issue with uh, the school teacher. And he'd be like, you know what? You can't, you can't keep singing all over the place. You're supposed to stick in alto, you're alto, you have to stick in alto. So he'd be like, Angie, is that you again? Angie, am I here in green tenor? Angela, is that you doing soprano? Like, and my voice is always so loud, but everywhere. So finally, he kicked me out of the school choir. And then I went and I started my own choir. And then we, you know, we started doing our own thing with our own, like, you know, our own runs and, you know, that kind of singing, like American style, Whitney. Because I'd, I'd be watching Whitney. I learned from Whitney and my choir. I kept the school choir sing the way Whitney and Tony Braxton do it. So finally, he kicked me out of the school choir. I started my own school choir, which is not a problem. So finally, that story ended, that cover you but it ended with me with my own school choir. So when I went to Canada, uh, my dad paid for singing lessons. And uh, the first thing that the, that my that singing teacher noticed was like, oh my God, you have a powerful voice. And I said, I explained to her how I'm in the choir. She goes, no, you're not meant to be in the choir. You're meant to lead a choir because you have a powerful voice. And when you're a powerful soloist, you're everywhere, you know? One minute I'm doing a run in, 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 in tenor, then in, in coming with some gangster auto, uh, like alto and then uh, soprano. So she taught me that I'm supposed to lead the choir, meaning I'm supposed to be a soloist. But in Uganda, the best thing they did was kick me out of the choir. So that shows you the difference. No, no, I know I told you, oh, you're supposed to be a soloist. That's what I learned in Canada. But in Uganda, I kicked out my friend, Madame, Madame, you know. So that was a great learning experience. And from then, you know, my dad was paying $40 an hour for me to learn how to sing and to train my voice. I have such a huge range, octave range. So just training me and, and learning and, and, and joining singing talent shows in Canada. Um, it was such an experience, an exciting experience. And that's when I learned. And then when I went to England, I was always like, hands down. If we had like a, a singing talent show, guess who's on stage? It's a rap. Angela comes on. I do my greatest level of all with Houston. She went, you know what I'm saying? Eh? Like I was always getting standing ovations to the extent that the last uh, uh, school uh, in university in England, 
the last uh, singing talent show that I, I won, the dean of the university now referred me to a place called Ponanas on Oxford, uh, Corn Market Street in Oxford, a place called Ponanas where they were looking for a lead artist. And the dean of my, I didn't even know the dean knew me at Oxford, like in Oxford Books, it was a huge campus. I had no idea he knew me, but apparently yeah, the talent had spread, yeah? people had heard. <laughs> So he was like, you know what, you need a lead, you need a lead singer, call Angela. So I come back from holidays from Uganda, I'm in England, like relaxing on my bed, you know, going through my quest work. And, and these people call and they're like, oh my God, uh, we got your number from the Dean. We, he's referred you to be the lead singer of our club. And we're ready, we're ready to pay you 300 pounds a night to be the lead singer. I'm like, huh, 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 what? The Dean, what? Well, you know, questions were many, you know what I'm saying? But I was, I was touched that my talent had been recognized by the dean of the university and, and people were seeing me as a serious singer and they were hiring me like serious. 300 pounds at 18, a serious money. <laughs> you know, that's serious money. So that's when I went and I, you know, took it to an international level and sing with a live band. And, and that's been the short, um, story of my career and then from there i came to Ghana. then i started recording in 2005 officially so yeah so in a nutshell that's been my singing during my because i did an, an economics degree and a law degree and then i did a master's degree in international management i finished by 19. so between the economics degree and the, when i started doing the master's degree like my day job like my side side job was that so i did that for a year during the master's period after that i got i, I during my singing it at Punanas, i met this african-american beautiful six Put for beautiful thing. He looked. Everybody says he looked like Kobe Bryant. Like beautiful. I met him in England when I was singing, and this guy would come and watch me, African American, like in the Air Force. He'd come and watch me. I thought he was looking at the band because by then I was like 100 kilograms. So I'm like, there's no way he can be looking at me. He's got to be. Kobe. Okay, he was looking at me. <laughs> then he asked me for a date. Like after like watching me six times, like I love your voice. Can we have a date? He asked me to marry him. I was more than honored. <laughs> Too happy. He was my first boyfriend. He was my first love. He was my first ever thing. So for me, it was like, it's okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So we married, then we moved to Chicago. And then uh, Chicago, I didn't really perform much. I, I got like big jobs, like uh, the late Isaac Hayes Music Food Passion. I was performing there. I like, I was hired to manage <clears throat> and there were a lot of performing, performing artists who used to come through, like Alicia Keys would come through. I would just learn from them. I would like, I'd say, wow, I would see how they command the crowd without doing so much, you know? Not for climbing walls and da da da, and they, you know, just like with their voices, they command the crowd. I, would, I learned from them. Uh, R. Kelly came through, Donald Jones, uh, Isaac Hayes himself, the owner of the property, would perform sometimes, like watching these breaks do their thing and me managing the joint was an honor so i learned from experience i just watch mainly so there's not much performing i did when i was in the states it was mainly one thing i ended up getting a job at a casino this job i actually i quit this job to get a better job because my 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 resume was always good everyone was like wow degree in economics degree in law masters in international management wow we, we want her we have to have her so i was that chick on paper paper <laughs> you know for for, for for business they always wanted that so i got uh easily got the other job but then the problem is also the marriage didn't work out so i started having it was now two years into the marriage the marriage really wasn't working we're fighting a lot uh it didn't work out I broke up it was miserable actually he first ended it with me i was i was in misery i'm like we're married we're supposed to be together forever he's like nothing lasts forever you know it was a, a, a good awakening. You know, my first love, it was, it was too much. I was surprised at everything because I'd never been in a relationship. I'd ne clearly never been married by the time I'd never been in a relationship. But I thought that when people make a commitment to be married forever, it's supposed to be forever. So the fact that we were having fights and things weren't going well and, and you can easily throw in the towel was shocking to me. I remember getting, uh, I was 100 kilograms at the time. 
I remember losing 38 kilograms in three weeks. I was devastated. I remember praying to Jesus to kill me. I wanted to die. Um, I, I, I grew up with seven boys, so I did not have that. Nobody taught me about relationships or how it would work out with men or no one. I just learned from experience. So it was, it was tough and it was traumatic, but it was life changing. So he left and I was devastated. And then the funny thing is he came back after three weeks, but the fact is those three weeks woke me up, made me realize that life, I have to be independent. I have to depend on myself. I have to love myself. I have to take care of myself. I have to work hard. I can't depend on my parents. You know, I learned a lot. I, it was the best and worst experience of my life, but I learned. I chose to look at it as the best. I learned a lot, you know? So he came back and he came back, yes, but eventually I'm the one who broke it off because I realized we weren't meant to be together. And then I got this casino job where I was getting about $100,000 a year. A lot of money for a young girl at my age. And uh, I was, you know, in some big girl game. I loved it. Uh, but I was not happy. I remember my, my mom calling saying, you're in the States, but you, you don't sound happy. And indeed I wasn't happy. Why? Because I wasn't singing. I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. Yes. I used my degrees to get these jobs and my degrees were now in practice, but I just was not happy. So she's like, why don't you come to Ghana for a few weeks and see, and then. At that time, you still the music part, part one. Yeah, I didn't know, but. I just felt like I'm not even singing. I remember saying to her, but I'm not even singing. I'm just here working. She's like, but you're making a lot of money. I'm like, yeah, but I don't even see it. It's progressive tax. The more I make, the more they tax. It's like 40% of your salary is taxed. Um, the mortgage was so expensive. I think I was paying, paying about 1,200 per month for my mortgage, my car note. I had a Lexus. I was driving. I was paying about $1,000 a month for that. Everything, all the money would just go. You know, I was, I, and then plus I wasn't happy. You know, I felt like I wanted to sing and I wasn't doing that. I was now like focused on work. So she said, come to Uganda for two weeks and see. So I came to Uganda for two weeks and I was in heaven. Like the weather, the people I felt celebrated in Uganda. Unlike the United States where I felt tolerated. Getting a visa alone is a crisis. Everything is a crisis. Everybody's individual. Nobody cares. Here it's a more collective environment. People love you. You celebrated this family, the environment. Heaven. When I came here for two weeks, I ended up, my parents were like, why don't you sing, record? You know, we've paid so much money, $40 an hour for you to learn to sing. You have an amazing voice. You've been singing and winning all these talent shows. You've been singing professionally, learn, record. That's when I started recording and uh, enjoying it and before you know it my music is like everywhere and, and i'm an instant hit and i'm like oh my god and i didn't even know i was an int i didn't even know i was a hit when i was a hit so things were just happening and all in favor of uganda so i went back to the states and then i i uh you know sold my condo my condominium and and uh, returned the lexus and i just I, I, I was done i was just done with the united states and then I remember my uh, husband at the time was like, so are you, are you, but then I'd moved out. Like I'd left, like I'd ended it with him. So I'd moved out to another place. And uh, he was like, so I hear you're going to Uganda. I'm like, yeah, just for a little while. A little while became one, two, three, four, five years. He's like, hello, madam. When are you coming back? I'm like, never. <laughs> He's like, when are you coming back home? This is your home. I'm like, no, nah. Uganda is my home. You know, I've not, I finally now believe that I am home. I'm where I'm, I'm supposed to be because I was happy. Finally, after so many years, yes, I got the exposure from abroad. Yes, yes, I was educated from abroad. Yes, I even speak like you guys, but guess what? This is where I feel alive and I feel happy and I feel at home. So then he got annoyed. He sent the divorce papers. He's, I signed them. I think well, he wanted to kutisa me, wanted to scare me. I'm like, you are joking. Where about it? I notarized. <laughs> I got them notarized, sent them back. He was like, he was like, damn, that was fast. I'm like, not fast enough. <laughs> like for the first time, I didn't even know it, but my heart was happy, you know, and uh, being around family, being around loved ones. My brothers also came back. Although even my brothers were like, I just back in Uganda. 
they left England, New York. Everyone was like, you know what, Uganda is where it's at. You know, so everybody's just, it just happened, you know, because they were going through the same experiences. You know, everybody thinks abroad is heaven, but mm, for us, it was mm, hell. So when I started recording, yeah. my dad was like, why don't you record music? And I started recording and then um, my first song was Standing in the Rain. And it was pretty much about my experience with my husband, ex-husband at the time, you know, how, no, at the time it was husband. And how he, he literally left me standing in the rain, like really, we're in this together and then you just dump me and you know, it was, it was an emotional song about that. And I remember a lot of people asking me on radio, he, he, she's lying. Like, that's not a Ugandan. She doesn't sound Ugandan. Yeah, I remember there was so much talk about that. And then after that, I did I Live For You, which to date is my biggest song. Um, and then after I Live For You, and all these songs I was recording at uh, Fish, Fishnet with uh, Isaac Rucci. Uh, it was owned by uh, Rugasina, Andrew Rugasina. And then after I did uh, Sicheta, I remember I was uh, I was doing Sicheta at Dream Studios. But then I was like, you know, you gotta hear this, you gotta record from this studio. And everyone was like, you know, in the music industry, they come through, come through, you know. So I went to Dream Studios. I found out about Dream Studios in, in Kamocha and then uh, Washington. We did a song together. We did Sicheta. It was literally just my song, but it was so difficult because I didn't know Luganda. It was such a hard song, and a boy called Huntington is the one who wrote it. So I did it and I reported it alone. And then at Washington, I remember him calling Baby Cool in the studio like, yo boy, you need to hear this chick's voice. Do you know what I'm saying? And Baby Cool comes through. Before you know it, Baby is like, you don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Let me do my part, you do this part. I was happy because it was less, less Luganda. Because it was stressful singing those Luganda words. So I'm like, no problem. Take as much as you want. As long as I can do the little, little part, fine. So then he came in, that's how it ended. It ended up a duet with Angela Karatuma and Bebe Cool, which on the local market became obviously my biggest hit because everybody knew Sicheta, you know? And then after that, I did so many other songs and I got in, involved in charity work, the, the Bulu. Actually, before, before Bulu, I did Peace with Butcherman. And then um, some German lady was so impressed with the Peace song. She's like, we're having a Bulu song, a, a For You Bulu. We're doing a, a guru walk can you come and join us can you do a song for the guru walk and i'm like okay why not and that's how i ended up doing for you guru which became now i think my biggest hit because that did so well and before you know it my parents are like why didn't you start a charity then i started the angela katatumba development foundation ngo because of the success of for you guru it was received so well um i remember what david achana on the second in guru um, invited me for dinner at his house, the king of Acholi inviting me for dinner because people were like, eh, who is this chick from Western Uganda who's singing about Gulu and our issues? Like, nobody's ever cared. Some, suddenly somebody's singing. So by then I didn't think it was a big deal because I, I didn't know, I didn't know, by then I didn't know the politics in Kampala. I just knew, oh my God, people's ears and noses are being chopped off. I gotta sing about that. You know, by then I didn't know. But when I was invited by the king, and my parents were like, you need to go and see what you've been singing about. I had only read about it on the internet because of the, my German friend had told me about the Bulwark. So when I went and the king invited me for dinner and there were like over 10,000 people and all this, all these clips on YouTube, 10,000 people to see Angela Karatumba. But it to touch me, you know, just to see me, who is this girl who's singing? You know, it was, by then I did not know the magnitude of the Gulu my Gulu song and my, my For You Gulu project. But it was so huge. And in Gulu, um, I was received like a like queen, you know, everywhere. You have like cars going around saying, Angela Karatuma is here. You know, Gulu song, my Gulu song is everywhere. And it was, it was overwhelming. And before you know it, when I came back to Kampala, I mean, the king of Acholi even named me Laker. Laker means, well, Laker. For me, I call it Laker, but it's a Laker, meaning princess. Like nobody, the king, when he starts telling you how nobody cared about our issues except this young, young girl who started an NGO and then I delivered um, over, um, um, CNN reported a million dollars, but I wasn't counting. All I knew people were giving me things in Kampala, I'm taking computers, I'm taking mattresses, I'm taking 
hundreds of millions of worth of things. I'm taking to Gulu to the king to donate to his people. So by the time CNN comes to the country and says, from what we've seen, you've delivered over a million dollars worth of stuff to Buddha. I'm like, really? That much? How did you know? And then by the time CNN is coming to Uganda to interview me on my Gulu project, Al Jazeera is coming to Uganda to interview me on my Gulu project, Dushvela, Voice of America, twice. I, I think when things happen, they happen. I had no idea that the magnitude of my For You Gulu project and song would reach international levels. So that's been by far my biggest project, charity-wise, and song. So yeah, then I got involved into charity, and then um, climate change. The British Council appointed me climate change ambassador after the success of my uh, For You Gulu project. I think it's just, you know, things ha started happening. And then I started balancing music and charity work. The majority has been using, pushing my charity, but using my music to push my charity. And I think that that is what I'm meant to do, to use my voice and my music to push. Because I'm also not settled and comfortable when I just sing about love, 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 love. You know, I want to change society. I want my music the way, the way it did for Guru. I want my music to make an impact. I want my music to, 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 to change generations. Do you know what I'm saying? To impact generations in such a powerful way like it has with climate change and for you, Gulu. And now Mulago Yafe, exactly. You know what I'm saying? And now the Mulago, that's what I'm comfortable. That's where I feel happy. Because I grew up in an environment where my parents had grew up, gave us everything, did everything. And the fact that every time we had everything, but every time my parents were struggling to do something for charity, every time I'm seeing my, my parents, you know, importing containers, uh, for, for the Katatumba Free School of 800 kids that they opened up in Embarara. And I'd be like, why are you stressing yourselves with those containers? You have your money, chill. Go on holiday. And they're like, no, you, you need to understand life. When you have, you need to give. If you've been blessed to have, you need to even get more blessings by giving. So I learned that from them. And so now the, the, the satisfaction I get from singing is when my music is used to, to do something. Like Mulago, to change Mulago. To, to sing about the Cancer Institute, to sing about whatever issue is, is, is important in society. So I just balance the two and I enjoy it. So the latest project is the Mulago Yafe, which I started in 2014. Unfortunately, I had an uncle and an auntie at Mulago, extremely sick, cancer, sick. And we would have to go and see them at Mulago. And going to see them, it's for jumping over people. I couldn't believe it. Our hospital in Uganda, it's for jumping over people. To go and see my auntie there, you know, it was, it was traumatic. And finally, when I go to see her, she's in a room that used to be a bathroom. You know, it's like, what's, what's, what's going on? And then you hear everybody on TV or all these rich people are like, when I get sick, I fly abroad, read the papers, people are flying up. Like, why fly? What? If I really get an emergency, I don't want to fly abroad. abroad. I want to be taken care of here. Like, I, I need to know that there's a hospital around here that can handle an emergency because how many times when you're in an emergency, will you book a flight, da, 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 even if you're chartering a flight, organize it, then fly to the runway, then does it even make sense? Why don't we as Ugandans focus on our own? So in the midst of visiting my auntie and my uncle, it, it was emotional. And I'm a very emotional person. It was for crying, crying, you know? Till I'm like, you know what? I, I always believe in, uh, Kennedy says, ask, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I'm like, why can't I, you know, start a project that will create awareness with my music about this situation here, like this, some crazy situation right here. This is our national referral hospital. Where like, I remember my brother had a knee operation and we did all the knee operation the other day in the private hospitals. And then they said, yeah, but we've done the best we can, but now you need to go where? To Mulago, like to go where? Taking who where? You know what I'm saying? And they're like, yeah, all the doctors here will pay. And they're like, no, but the machine is there. You know, so, right? you know, the type thing. So, you think about it, whether you're rich, poor, the fact is all roads lead to Mulago. Whoever dies in Uganda goes to Mulago. And then none of their bodies be taken to Mulago. 
So all roads lead to me. Why can't we better Mulab? That's when I started the Mulab Yafe campaign. Did a song, did a video that I released actually today. I, I premiered it on my TV today. And uh, why can't we encourage each other Ugandans to donate and do something for Mulago? And that's how that happened. And um, the first person to get on board was His Excellency Wavamuno, with Spia Motors and WBS TV. And they donated um, 30 million worth of clothes, brand new clothes for the maternity ward in Mulago Hospital. And seeing them receive it and happy and, and getting all these people to come on board, Apala Pharmaceutical Industries, painting the wards at Mulago. You know, I'm like, okay, we can do this. If we organize Ugandans, the way we did for For You Gulu, climate change, we can do it for Mulago. And then um, uh, recently, the Uganda Bikers Association um, joined the Mulago Yafe campaign and they're fundraising. They're bikers that they ride, they, they ride inside Uganda and outside of Uganda. And they fundraise money. They fundraised so far over 117 million for Mbuya, uh, for, for Reach Out Mbuya. For the, they used to fundraise for the last, since 2003 till 2015, for the last 12 years, they've been fundraising consistently for Reach Out Mbuya. Uh, uh, there is HIV kids affected and infected with HIV. And now the fact that they, and they've raised 117 million so far. The fact that they're like, wow, we want to be part of the Mulago Yafe campaign and uh, fundraise for the Cancer Institute, to me is beyond an honor because who is Angela Karatumba Development Foundation to receive such donors, to believe in me, to believe in my music, to believe in my cause. To me, I'm, I'm the honored one. So they recently um, appointed me the ambassador uh, two weeks ago. And yeah, we started, uh, Yesterday we flagged off a charity, the, the first cancer charity ride to Ginger. And then it's going to be continuous rides like that till South Africa, to, to Zanzibar, to Namibia, Malawi, back to Uganda. While they're fundraising and the money will go towards the uh, Cancer Institute under the Mulago Yafe campaign to Mulago. So... This is what my music is doing. This is what I love to do. These are the causes I enjoy and I feel alive doing, not just singing about love and that song expires and tomorrow I come and sing about love. You know what I'm saying? Eh? I want the way for you Guru brought to the international media. I think it's more imp impactful to sing about a cause, do something about it, and then move on to something else. So I'm excited about that new project of mine. <laughs> So the future, I love talking about the future. Um, I remember when I started singing, my family, my parents were like, you know, just be a role model. Just be decent. Just do your best. And most importantly, like my mom says, be happy. Be happy doing what you're doing. And love it. So the future is what I'm doing right now. Ever since I left the United States, um, I've been doing, and I chose to do what I want to be seen doing forever. I run my dad's hotel hotel diplomat i'm the managing director the future is to see the hotel diplomat restored to its former glory um to make it great again uh, we've had some court issues we won yes but uh there's an appeal but i'm 100 percent sure good willing we're gonna win that um and as soon as we have we're done going through that challenge the whole idea because he owes us um Shumuk has been ordered to pay us 12 million dollars and we're waiting for that payday, but of course it's appealed, it's delaying tactics. Okay, it's all right. It's gonna happen uh, to restore that hotel diplomat to its former glory. But meanwhile, go through the challenges and, and happily with God, you know? Um, so that's number one in the future. And that's what I love doing. That's what I do every day, run hotel diplomat in Muyanga. Then two, singing. I love singing. I am born a singer, I, I mean, there's nothing that tells me more than I was born to sing than everywhere I go, winning contests and concerts and, you know, Canada, England, America, name it. Hands down, if Angela is on, it's a wrap. Do you know what I'm saying? That's a gift from God. I appreciate it and I thank God for it. Um, the future is to, I, I run my, my life, I run my music as a, as a marathon because music is a long-term goal for me. It's not short-term. I don't want to make money today in music and run away. I want to enjoy music. I want to be on stage when I'm 60, 70, Tina Turner, Celine Dion, you know, 60s and above. It's a marathon race. 
and you cannot run a sprint in a marathon race. And it's so unfortunate that a lot of artists run a sprint race in a marathon race. You see the Kenyans and the Ethiopians, that's why they are beating everybody in the world, you know? They take their time, they take their time, then at the end, you know, they, you know, they literally, but others are like, <laughs> you can't do that in a marathon race. It's a long distance, three hour in, for music. It's like a, a lifetime, 70 year plus. Miriam Makebo, I think was in her 80s. Do you know what I'm saying? That's, that's music. So I don't want to run my music in a marathon, in a, in a sprint way, and then burn out and start an awesome half quit or collapse or die of juggle stress. I was always Whitney, but now that Whitney died, Tony Braxton. Well, that's my idol, like for real, for real. You know, and even now she's running the marathon race, you know? Like she's in it to win it. Like take your time. Like music, it's for taking your time. It's not for pressure. You know, you don't have to have a hit every year. It's, it's not even possible. Like if, if no, just take your time with it. Love it. When I when I'm invited to perform somewhere, I perform. When like um in the next next this week actually next week I'm going to Gulu. I've been hired to go and perform. You know, take it easy. You know, do my charity, do singing. You know, that's what I want to do for the next. 80 years, God willing. Do you know what I'm saying? This is the future plans. Continue doing my music, my number one love. And then the third thing is charity. I foresee and I pray to have an Angela Katatuma Development Foundation house in town. That is the future. Where we think of what goal, what's urgent now, and we target it, we raise awareness, we organize our funds and we make a difference. So I'm doing what I want to do for the rest 80 or 90 years. And I pray that the Lord gives me the strength, the wisdom, the help, you know, and the happiness to, to do that. So that's what I see in my future. Thank you so much. <laughs>